First of all, thank you so much for meeting with us and for letting us talk with you. We did a project in August where we went through um, all of the school exit surveys that were filled out by teachers at Austin ISD and several other schools uh, during the pandemic. And this represents all of them from Austin ISD. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to read a couple of them to you, just a few. Um, this is one on pay from a teacher who resigned in 2021. It became economically infeasible to continue working for on a teacher's salary. Another said, I can no longer afford to live in Austin without increasing my salary. I wish to pursue this promotion to remain in Austin and in good standing with AISD. Another contract release form said, I've been working 60 to 70 hours weekly, despite efforts from campus staff and admin to mitigate ongoing and glaring issues. The lack of work-life balance is why they're saying they're leaving. What's your reaction to hearing teachers say these reasons for why they're leaving education? Well, the, the number one priority that we have operated under for the last uh, six or seven years is uh, the priority of recruit, support, retain teachers and principals. We know that teachers are the single most important in-school factor that impacts student outcomes. And we have to be pretty relentless in our efforts to try to support them. And this involves a host of different factors. It involves compensation, which uh, several of those teachers mentioned. It involves issues related to work-life balance and working conditions generally, the kind of training and support that we offer. Uh, it is critical for us to get this right. Uh, and it is very difficult uh, to get uh, right because teaching is an extremely difficult profession. Um, if you want an easy life, uh, get a job as an investment banker. But if you want to make a difference, uh, work as a teacher because the, the work is extraordinary. They, they have to. Uh, you, 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 if you think about what a neurosurgeon does, for example, a neurosurgeon prior to surgery, they're going to cleanse their body of impurities. They're going to think about everything that could go right or go wrong during that, um, that surgical procedure. They're going to think about the laser, the scalpel, all the tools of the trade, what they read in the most recent medical journal, what they reflected on in the patient's case history, and then they walk into the operating room to operate on a brain. And they operate on one brain at a time, and it's asleep and our teachers are operating on 20 brains at a time and they're very much awake giving active feedback. So um, it is incumbent upon us to uh, provide teachers with the best supports that we can. Uh, and that's what we uh, attempt to do from TEA and from the state level perspective. But of course, you gotta remember there's 1,200 individually governed school systems. So um, you had several comments from Austin ISD, one school system here in Central Texas. Um, and each school system has its own operational control, its own procedures, its own approach to um, uh, its own pay scale, its own everything. And so uh, there's, there's a high degree of variability in that. There's a, so there's a truism in, in the HR world that you don't qu uh, quit a job, you quit a boss. Um, and that's, that's still something that we have, to, we have to invest in our instructional leaders, our principals, um, the way that we uh, support schools in supporting teachers. But we also have to make sure that what we have uh, done generally is, is set up a, a profession that allows people to have a work-life balance, that allows them to grow in the craft, to pursue autonomy and excellence the way that we would want, and allows them to have a wage that can take care of themselves and their family. I wonder, you're obviously the top official in Texas when it comes to education, looking over all these different institutions, all these different districts. What has it been like for you personally as a parent to watch so many teachers exit this field at the rate that they are over the last several years in particular? Yeah, so um, uh, I, both as a parent and as a policymaker, because I've got four kids, so our, we have twins that are four and a half, so they're not in school yet, but I have a first grader and a, um, and a, a fourth grader here in, the, uh, in public school in, in the Austin area. And, um, uh, and so we, we lived this, we experienced this um, uh, day in, day out. But um, the, uh, everyone's school environment is actually different. Um, and so uh, there, there have been disruptions, like a music teacher that um, left in the middle of the school year uh, for one of my kids. But um, the, the, the school has done, I think, a, a fairly effective job at supporting educators on that campus, creating a culture of love and discipline, making sure that um, uh, teachers are, are supported and respected. Um, but uh, you're going to see that vary um, from um, campus to campus. And so switching from my dad hat to my policy making hat, we can see that in data statewide. So we currently employ more teachers than we've ever employed before in the state of Texas. This is not a well understood fact. We have, um, uh, what's it, 300 and 
78,000 or 388,000 teachers-ish. I think it's 378. Um, uh, so we, we are currently employing more teachers. Those are not spots. Those are actual employed people. Uh, they, uh, we currently have the smallest class sizes on average that we've ever had as a state. Um, we have the highest pay on average that we ever had as a state. And coming out of COVID, we also have the highest turnover rate that we've ever had as a state. So it's, um, those are seemingly conflicting facts. How can you have more teachers than you've ever had before, but also have more vacancies than you've ever had before? Um, uh, and they are, in fact, both true statements. Um, we've invested pretty heavily in public education during the um, uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. There was an extra $20 billion um, of funds invested in public education, a lot of new teaching positions, a lot of new other positions created, and it's caused a decent amount of vacancies um, uh, in the state. Um, and so uh, I think the question for us as policymakers is how do we, again, um, uh, create the kind of supports the, the policymaking environment that encourages more stability in, in the profession and in the classroom. Um, but of course then each individual district has to manage its own affairs uh, locally, which, um, which will lead to some degree of inconsistency um, for, for different, uh, different folks in the state. When we were interviewing teachers who left, a lot of what their issue was, aside from pay, was the impact that these legislative requirements left on them. They described every year there being more and more and more on their plate and school districts often not even having the time in the school day or the funding to pay them extra for all the additional work they were doing. I mean, for instance, HB 4545, uh, teachers, every single teacher that I spoke with had an issue with it. Those are all teachers in Austin ISD? Austin ISD teachers that I spoke with who are on your task force mentioned that this was problematic for them. It wasn't just Austin ISD. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult, uh, there's, there's no doubt that it is a challenge to, um, to, to teach a classroom full of 20 kids to try to get them rigorous instruction, get them on grade level, support kids who are behind. You know, one of the great things that our teachers do is they work with all the kids in their classrooms and they, uh, they try to differentiate individualized instruction but it's extremely difficult. Um, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we have given them the resources that, that don't require them to work after hours and on nights and weekends. And so you think about the idea of a, of a teacher trying to, to, to find a new lesson um, uh, that they wanna teach next week as opposed to that they've received that resource, say from the district um, or directly from the state in terms of uh, the uh, you know, well-planned lessons, well well-designed instructional materials so that they don't necessarily have to spend all their time both designing lessons and delivering lessons. Um, you know, this was a, a recurring theme that came from members of the task force. Think about the, 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 the time that teachers know they need to spend providing individualized supports to students and then have they been given that time. So you think about the organization of the school day at a campus level, the staffing pattern that a school district uses, um, even at the elementary school, little things. Um, who walks the kids to recess and watches over recess? Is it the core content classroom teacher or is it a teacher's assistant? Um, and different districts answer that question um, in different ways and it can have a significant effect on um, the work-life balance and the overall load of our teachers. And so I think we have to be very thoughtful, very intentional about how we, um, uh, for lack of a better word, engineer the school experience to make sure that uh, teaching um, uh, can still be, uh, you know, a, uh, a very fulfilling and successful uh, profession for, for all of our teachers around the state. Mm -hmm. I want to move to these specialized positions where we've seen a lot of vacancies special education, um, bilingual teachers. At the start of the school year, Austin ISD had 90 special education vacancies. Houston ISD had 40. Dallas ISD had 63. Can these districts, in your opinion, serve parents and students well with 60 plus uh, vacancies? in those departments? I mean, it's, it's uh, extremely difficult um, to execute your mission if you haven't um, uh, you know, staffed your organization effectively. And this is a, um, this is a problem that I think districts wrestle with uh, throughout the state. I'll give you the example, you, you brought up three districts, so I'll give you the example of, uh, example of Ector County. So three or four years ago, uh, Ector County uh, had started the school year with 300 vacancies, and it's, it's a bit smaller than many of those districts, so that's a lot of teacher vacancies. 
Um, and that had been a, a trend for uh, quite possibly a decade in Hector County. This is where Od Od Odessa is where Hector County is. And, um, uh, and so what the district began to do is, are there, are there different ways for us to organize uh, our, 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 the way that we organize the instructional experience? Could we, for example, have lead teachers that would have apprentice teachers working underneath them across multiple classrooms? Um, sort of different, uh, uh, organized the sort of the school experience both for our students and our teachers in a different way. And so they made those changes and the year after they made those changes they started uh, with uh, maybe maybe 30 vacancies and they, they were f filled within, um, within the start of the school year. And so this is a, uh, it requires, I think, it requires us to change the instructional model and there are schools around the state that are on the bleeding edges of these changes and in fact we heard from many during the during the teacher vacancy task force um, we have to make sure that we um, are as thoughtful as possible as in setting up the leadership environment the idea that we can create opportunities for teachers themselves to to grow into leadership positions um, uh, teachers that are teaching a classroom full of students and then uh, for a portion of the day, and then a portion of the day they're coaching several other teachers to grow their capacity. This is a, a you know, great leadership opportunity. Many of the teachers on the, on the task force sort of spoke to that, um, that kind of compelling opportunity. So that's, that's not available everywhere, but it's, an avail it's available in a lot of schools. And so the, the recommendations coming out of the task force, I think, are, are particularly thoughtful because it's, um, it is a mix of things that uh, school districts themselves, it's in their locus of control, pr the pr best practices for them to attempt to implement, as well as things for us in Austin to improve the way that we support all of our schools statewide. And it's really going to take both of those um, actions moving in unison to, to help improve our support for teachers and consequently our support for students. I saw in the report that the task force was talking a lot about monetarily incentivizing these roles. Describe to me exactly what TEA can do on your level to help these districts get these jobs staffed so that they can, so these kids can have one-on-one -on -one aids that they need in special education department. Yeah, so the, um, we're a creation of the Texas legislature, so we, we do what the uh, statute uh, uh, directs of us. But one of, our, um, one of our roles is actually to sort of be an amplifier. So we... Um, uh, because, because we can see across all 1,200 school systems in ways that sometimes they can't um, see their neighbors the same way that we can. We can identify uh, really innovative practices, innovative staffing models, innovative compensation approaches, innovative um, uh, teacher development approaches, innovative recruitment approaches in districts all over the state. Um, and then, again, try to spread that um, uh, practice around the state. Um, uh, and now individual school boards, individual superintendents are in charge of their own districts. But uh, when we can share with them, district in a similar situation has tried this, this, is, you know, this worked well, this didn't work well, it, it enables us in, a, in an environment largely of local control with locally governed uh, schools around the state of Texas for that um, people who are then closest to the problem to, to find practices that make sense in their communities, in their context, and then try to implement them. So that's a, that's a key role of the agency, is simply to share those best practices to facilitate um, uh, improvement in, in those practices uh, in the way that they're implemented in districts all over the state. Got it. Um, one thing that came up several times when we were talking to lawmakers was the teacher incentive allotment. It's been talked a lot about as a way to improve teacher salaries, but outside of becoming nationally board certified, districts have to take the initiative to start this process with TEA in order to be able to put forth teachers for that designation to be able to get those dollars. Is there an easier way to use this program to get teachers their bonuses than districts having to go through this process that sometimes they don't get approved for. Yeah, so uh, this, this came up in conversations recently in uh, legislative hearings uh, too. So there's some recommendations I think in the task force report and then discussions with um, uh, key, key leaders in the legislature about how can we provide uh, more technical assistance so it's a, it's a faster path for districts to offer these uh, designation opportunities for their teachers. I think there's a pretty strong appetite for that kind of support um, uh, and, and hopefully we see action on that and that should help speed up uh, adoption um, for districts around the state. The, the other thing I would, I would highlight even from your question, you referred to them as bonuses. So the um, uh, compensation best practices would say don't structure them as bonuses, make it part of base pay. 
Um, and there are districts that have done that with their teacher incentive allotment. Um, it's been incorporated into their overall salary schedule, which we think is a much um, uh, um, more fruitful long-term path to both to re recruit and retain uh, talented staff in, in the field. I want to ask you one more question and I'll shift a little bit but and let my colleague Nabil come in. But I wonder, you're, you've got a bird's eye view of this. Like you mentioned, you're having to take a look at all the districts within the state who have very different needs, um, very different situations. In your opinion, if the rate of teachers continues like this, leaving the field, what will education look like in Texas if we continue to see teachers leave the profession at this rate? Yeah, the, the, the trend has been, this is not like a near, this is not a new trend. This has been a 30 year trend and this is not specific to, to Texas. This is education in the United States. Um, the, the, a teacher that you were, the teacher that you were most likely to run into in 1985 had 10 years of experience. Um, so if you think about the distribution of teachers by years of experience, the, 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 the experience base you were most likely to run into had 10 years of experience. Um, for about the last decade, the teacher that you're most likely to run into was in his or her first year. Um, uh, and, uh, and so this, this I think, uh, again, begs the question of how do we increase preparation, training, support? How do we increase uh, or improve working conditions, address is issues of compensation um, uh, to, um, to help keep our teachers in the classroom longer? What we have done in Texas um, uh, is, we, you know, we have a very dynamic labor market, so um, we continue to hire more teachers in the aggregate, um, even um, even with some staff departures. So we've we we generally fill positions writ large, but um, a, a you know first year teacher uh, that is not necessarily goes through some uh, detailed preparation experience. It's not it's it's not the, quite the same thing. So. I, Again, I think there's a, there's a lot of effort that we have to do both uh, in all, across all 1,200 local school systems and practices um, uh, that need to change there, and then again, Im improved uh, support uh, here from Austin. I want to shift to the news that came out of last week, this audio with your deputy commissioner. Um, in the audio, we heard many things, but we heard him say, you know, talk about school vouchers. We heard him say, you know, try to get this parent to talk to the governor's speechwriter and uh, advocate for this school voucher program. We heard him describe that this could financially hurt local public school districts. My question to you is, how can school districts trust that the state agency they are accountable to has their best interest at heart after hearing that audio? Yeah, the, the, our mission at the agency is to provide leadership, guidance, and support to school districts to improve student outcomes. So um, well, we have, have got to address the needs of our students by supporting our school districts. That is, um, that is what we do. Um, uh, now we want to make sure that we serve our parents. There is a complaint process um, that we also oversee and we need to ensure that it's, uh, it's fair and, and balanced, that we have an uh, appropriately objective lens to it. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it is our objective to make sure that we have a, com a, a completely objective support system for schools uh, throughout the state. Um, our success is dependent upon the success of our local school districts, and, and we want to ensure that we provide them the leadership guidance and support that we can. For that, employee, the deputy commissioner, has there been a conversation of whether or not that was acceptable to say something like that on a call to a parent? Um, I think we've p uh, provided some statements from him in particular on that that, that address that question.